Welcome to You Talking with Greg. I am super excited to have Zach Stein here. It's good to be here, man. It's a long time. Amen. That's right. Thanks so much for coming. You know, I owe you a a tremendous debt of gratitude. I frame my uh, way of thinking these days in terms of a meta psychology. And uh, as I think you know, you prompted me and and prodded me in that direction, maybe accidentally, but... (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I can't take credit, of course. I mean, I got it from her for sure. And yeah, yeah, I know. Been but, insane, you know, but, whatever. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I owe the lineage to you. You pass it on down the line, but I wanted to give you <laughs> give you that note here. Thank you. So, um, so there's uh, any number of different places that we can go. Okay. Um, but um, uh, so I know that you've been working on the Consilience Project. That might be a cool place for us to start. You know that I'm very curious and supportive of that venture. So uh, an update on kind of what that is for the audience, and then we can get the latest in terms of where that is and then jump off perhaps from there. Totally. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. That's mostly where my head has been. It's been in the work on the consilience project uh, and it's a remarkable team. Uh, And the, and the basic idea is very similar to what you're, you're doing, Greg, like the, the, there's a actually consilience between (laughs) your meta psychology and the kind of, uh, theory of change of the consilience project, if you will, because uh, when you when you look at the broad, let's say, field of civilizational collapse or existential risk, um, and you consider where those what Schmachtenberg called what, what Schmachtenberg calls generator functions, where they are right. yep. that cause this type of civilizational collapse, institutional decline. Uh, going beyond the limits of growth, <clears throat> all of these things that are putting us in a very precarious situation. Right. So many of them are technological. We're aware of that there's too much CO2, there's too much pollution, there's all of these things in what Wilbur would call the lower right hand yep. quadrant, right? And, right. but there's a lot of them <laughs> that are in the interiors, that are in mm. the human psyche and the nature of the culture in the nature of the unintended, <clears throat> the unintended side effects of cultural and psychological innovation, yeah. uh, informational warfare, things that came out of the field of psychology itself yeah. and seeped into the design of technology, the design of persuasive communication uh, science. Um, mm. And so the Consilience Project is an effort to essentially kind of raise the level of reflectiveness of public sense making. By, by equipping people with what they need. And some of that is theory. Some of it's situational awareness. Right. Some of it's awareness of the media landscape itself. <clears throat> and these are the three large areas where we're working. We're doing foundational work in social philosophy, essentially. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. and then situational assessments, which are basically rich renderings of current events in terms of those foundational theory pieces in social philosophy and education and learning theory theory of civilization, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the third element is meta news analysis, where we actually apply those same epistemic principles to kind of like forensically look at the nature of how an event is covered. So you can imagine a situational assessment about, let's say the, the protests over the summer. Right. Uh, where you cover the protests, but then you also want to cover the way the protests were covered. You want to look like the news itself uh-huh. is an event. <laughs> totally. And so, so you do the meta news analysis that's on the consilience site now, uh, which I was heavily involved with. Right. Is analyzing specifically that it's analyzing that issue of the, the bricks that were planted ostensibly. Right. By pro, you know, by whoever mm-hmm. planted the bricks, we don't, don't know, right? <laughs> so that's it's a deep, rich rendering of that uh, I story. But it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So that so that's an example of applying theory and forensically looking at the the news cycle. And so the idea is that those kinds of basic um, texts, like, like a set of consilience papers, if you will, form the core of a catalyst of something that's broader that includes okay. curated resources community building, uh, and then eventually movement catalyzing. And so precisely bringing in people who are sophisticated enough to appreciate your model, mm. have the metacognitive awareness, and have the ability to do transperspectival look at an event in the news media, for example, giving them a place to convene and to begin to 
uh, take on the identity of someone who's trying to fix that kind of problem. So like we already have people that have the identity trying to fix that other kind of problem, like the environmental crisis <clears throat> or nuclear proliferation. Mm. You identify as an environmentalist, you identify as a peace activist, right? Right, right. So the question is who comes to identify as someone trying to fix the epistemic commons? Right. Who, where's the movement of people right. uh, that are trying to basically identify as concerned with what I, you know, the educational crisis as I see it. Um, right. And so that, uh, that leads us here <laughs> to someone like yourself who's trying to do that. And, uh, and as I've tried to be doing that uh, with education and yeah, so it's, it's an exciting project where it's just a beta launch at this point where we're moving right. forward with the idea and showing proof of concept that these forms of media and the transmedia object, which is the podcast and other things that kind of like <clears throat> include the core content, uh, that this type of thing can be made. And then eventually, well, we're going to be <laughs> moving at a rapid clip and, and growing and then hopefully finding ways to alter the shape of public discourse. And it's not clear how that's going to play out. That's where the innovation and the distributed collective intelligence needs to come in. Wow. It's such an intense and cool project, man. <laughs> it's beautiful. So a couple of things. Um, did, did you ever uh, stumble across real clear politics by any chance? Do you know that website at all? I, I do, but I, I couldn't kind anyway, of recite it for you. One yeah. of the things that, um, so, you, in terms of meta news, so one of the things that Real Clear Politics does is it takes uh, the op-ed pieces from around the world and pops them up twice a day into a local space, uh, and I found that to be cool. very useful. Uh, and so what you see on that uh, basically are left and right op-eds, and they organize them, you know. Uh, so and and then you have really available you, from a meta perspective just how much lensing is then being driven based on the team that people are on. So you read the exact same event, you know, and you get a completely different shaded narrative. Right. Uh, and what the service of the meta news, and I, I saw the piece uh, or aspects of the you do and talking about like, you know, were bricks planted in a, in a particular riot position? How do we actually understand that? Meaning the media is now so ingrained in particular types of lensing and schematics and political commitments, and they want to control the justification narrative in a particular way that they're they're not affording us a, a clear picture. They're, they basically have a, in many ways, a preordained. At least that's what I would argue. In many ways, is that there's essentially a preordained political narrative that drives not everything, but drives so much of the content that it's. Um, you know, and, and polarizing, you know, it's like basically a two meta two meta narratives against each other that then we are then forced to choose sides in in the in the macro level psychology. So the idea, I mean, we'll come back to the other things, but the idea of a meta news project um, that I love the epistemic comments. I mean, what a beautiful, you know, uh, framing there. But that, you know, the, the service that that does to people uh, potentially in terms of you know, returning our capacity to generate a democracy that actually has sheer reality or at least some yeah. semblance of coherence. It's really, really cool. Yeah, no, and that, and you're hitting the nail on the head. It's, it's actually, it's kind of easy to do meta news analysis yourself. It's just most people, for whatever reason, don't have the motivation to actually read Breitbart and then read the New York Times right. and then read a, a conservative one. And then read, like mostly people get locked in and there's, reasons for that and evidence for that. But but as soon as you start to do it, especially if you do it systematically where you gather them, and what we looked at 1700 stories <laughs> and then and then narrowed down to a key 100 basically, and then did thematic analysis of them and then found the kind of epistemological nuggets and mistakes and everything. And what you're saying about the control of the justificatory system is exactly to the point. This is what's so, um, in potentially insidious about a corrupt media environment is that they they don't just distort the view of the problem itself, <clears throat> they distort the way with which you are even able to speak about the problem itself mm. because they're mm. controlling the nature of the language, but not just the language, the forms of argument that count and that matter and that don't count. And so that's the level at which we're doing that. We're looking at both the themes that are being populated in the media landscape, but also the 
different forms of argumentation that are in play and you start to see the kind of ubiquitous normalization of certain forms of irrationality and unreasonableness. Uh, and so, so it's, but the funny thing is once you do meta news analysis and that becomes a new form of media, which is to say like a meta layer emerges on top of the media, uh, which then can norm it and check it because it becomes very clear <laughs> when you're, when you're looking, uh, it becomes right. actually almost a little embarrassing for the media yeah. outlets. I believe that they're so obviously, um, not doing what they uh, should be doing if they want to promote uh, democracy. So, so that's interesting that if it, be, if it becomes a new form of media analysis. Is, is uh, it your sense, I'm sorry to cut you off, but is it your sense that that forced narrative has really tightened down, maybe especially on the left over the last 10 to 20 years? I mean, I'll speak myself in the world of academia. I'm a leftist, you know, uh, I, you know but God, what I now experience is sort of a totalitarian articulation of the way I need to think about critical race theory or anti-racism, which becomes then sort of moralized normative thinking that then, you know, uh, questions anything that questions it. I, I mean, I experience that pretty intensely these days and I push back against it and got myself in trouble as a function of that. What's your sense? I mean, I know, you know, do you feel like the media that's my sense is that on the left in particular, the right already had its issues, or at least I'm a critic of that from my vantage point, but it feels like the polarization and the control of the narrative um, has, has evolved rigidly uh, in, in this direction. Is that your sense also? Uh, it is, and I would say one way to think about it is that we have, we've perfected the art of communication sciences and, <laughs> and advertisement. like. There was a time after World War I uh, when propaganda was studied very seriously because the, the war mobilization effort in World War I was extreme to get the United States involved. Um, and it's a very interesting moment in history. Uh, and there was a lot of overt manipulation of the media and overt fake news in the interest of galvanizing national support for entry to the war. <clears throat> it became clear as the war unfolded that tall tales were being told <laughs> and that specific truths were not being included. And so John Dewey, Walter Lippmann, there was a host of people after the war who said basically, whoa, man, we just ran disinformation on ourselves. <laughs> like that, we can't do that in a democracy. Uh, and there's an Institute for Propaganda Analysis, which was supported by philanthropic sources and had a lot of uh, academic backing. <clears throat> and uh, so that's one way that this topic was approached, progressive critique of propaganda. But what began to occur was that they began to um, basically objectively and scientifically look at the nature of propaganda, irrespective of the source of the propaganda, which meant that you're now saying that the good guys are making propaganda, yeah. right? So as the war mobilization effort for the Second World War began, and the Institute of Propaganda Analysis began to say, hey, <laughs> you're getting us to look at fascism this way is actually propaganda, right? And it is technically, it's being designed with exactly the same mechanisms uh, as the propaganda of the fascists <laughs> was the propaganda of those fighting the fascists. It was both using the same psychological control mechanisms. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about there, but by any definition of propaganda, it's so then what you had was this transformation of propaganda critique and propaganda analysis into communication science. Huh. People like Laswell and Bernays hmm. and others whose names are coincident with propaganda uh, and this transformation. Uh, hmm. And they were doing what were they called covert polling, right? Which is when you go out and you take a sample of a population and they don't know they're being sampled in order to design a message to reach them, right? So this was happening before the Second World War. So what began to occur was that it was not that we were opposed to propaganda, it was that we were opposed to the bad guys' propaganda, and actually we were going to perfect our own. Now, the problem then is that each of the political parties <laughs> began to go to war against each other. And so we began to self-propagandize the United States. Um, <laughs> and it was essentially uh, you know, modern propaganda. And then when the digital hit, 
uh, it changed drastically. It was like the weapons changing. It was like with the first American, uh, you know, when you, <laughs> when you, you know, the, the first American adoption of new weaponry, like advanced modern weaponry occurred with the civil war. That's one of the reasons it was such a violent conflict was because there were new forms of weaponry that outdid any of the old forms of, <laughs> of military adaptation. Uh, and so the, again, with this, it was like, okay, if we had that idea about propaganda, that was okay when we could only reach so many percentage of the people because modern propaganda is all, you only have the radio, you only have papers, newspapers, <laughs> right? What pamphlets, um, as soon as you get Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> right. uh, even as soon as you get television and spe more specifically cable television. And mm. one of the main, one of the main themes here is actually, uh, and this is documented in this book that came out of the Harvard center, uh, Berkman Klein center, this book network propaganda, which looks at the emergence of Fox news mm -hmm. as, as a network <clears throat> television. Uh, as one of those things that was fair like, and balanced, right? Well, <laughs> well, it was one of those things that was it was a trend setting move in the self propagandation of right. the states, not by the government, by the but by the political parties against themselves, which was different. Right. So like the government was unified in the lead up to World War Two in terms of creating propaganda to get people to support. Right. The right? right. But when you have the when you have the government disunified and self propagate propagandizing itself and you and then you perfect the tools of <laughs> the tools of that, the, the science of communication, um, as it were, uh, then yeah, you're led to this, you're led to this situation that we're in now. And, uh, it, and so that, yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous situation because highly propagandized cultural environments right. create, uh, things like scapegoats. Mm -hmm. Um, they, get people, and I'm talking about both sides, I'm not saying, I'm saying yep. anyone, if you believe you are seeing the truth and the other side is brainwashed and completely ridiculous, you're in the propaganda bubble, regardless yep. of the side. And in that context, you are required to accommodate a lot of unreasonable beliefs, mm -hmm. essentially, as part of your signaling group membership. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the group doing that requires actually accommodating logical incongruities and contrary evidence. Uh, and so the, the, the cost emotionally of maintaining group membership, it started and losing group membership, these things become very much more, much more important than logical consistency totally. um, and consistency with prior action yep. and other things. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's unfortunate. So the so the consilience project is like kind of an urgent project in a sense to try to bring together from both sides all those people who realize that we need to actually have this the perspective taking and synthesizing ability and earnest desire to not just model the other person's perspective. Yep. If you're even if you're steel manning it, but actually wanting to integrate it with your own, right and uh, absent that, there's no way to really resolve it. It's basically you're saying, I prefer war. That's what you're saying. You're right. like, <clears throat> you're like, I don't want reason and language to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to use reason and language to subvert the possibility that reason and language will work in order yep. to inevitably lead us to conflict. Right. So that's, a, that, that's bad. That's like a, from a family systems dynamic perspective, for example, Right, like that's a pretty dysfunctional household. <laughs> we probably like, wouldn't sign up for that a priori. That's what I'm saying. This is not where <laughs> this is not going to be a nice dinner conversation. Right. All the conversation, basically, everyone wants to escalate it to conflict. Um, yeah. So to de-escalate the conflict, you need the consilient move of actually scaffolding the ability to take multiple perspectives and to reflect on some elements of the. <clears throat> it's kind of. Uh, self, self propagandizing dynamic, right. Uh, right. which, which, when you do something like meta news analysis, just becomes <laughs> clear. You just see yeah. it. You're just like, wow. It's like you guys are reading from scripts. It's like if I know the side from which the argument's coming, I can basically predict the argument. Totally. It's they're like attorneys. I mean, they're like, well, we've got a case to win. <laughs> they are like, well, that's a very good point. Like, mm -hmm. so we're writing a couple papers actually in the works right now. One's uh, how to lie with facts. Mm. 
and the other one is how to make uh how to argue in bad faith <clears throat> and it's important to get that like yeah the a lawyer is a great example Jur you should understand journalists these days actually more like they're lawyers than like they're scientists or disinterested observers and translators of information they're they're trying to get you to take a certain action and take a certain position on an issue rather than trying to give you the full scope of the issue so you can make a decision yourself. And so it, the politicization of it and the absence of objectivity, which used to be part and parcel of the profession, <laughs> right? And uh, so, but again, so the question of why uh, the communication sciences emerged to be so powerful and why it became accepted that um, basically there should be something like an epistemic elite who crafts responsibly a message for the public who are actually not smart enough to do it themselves. Like this is the, the hidden theory of human nature that drives the creation of an information and media ecosystem like this. And this is what um, this is Walter Lippmann and John Dewey I'm talking about. This is what they're saying. Right. They're saying like, listen, you guys are behaviorists and Freudians who have a basically a very negative view of what's possible for humans. Um, mm -hmm. You don't actually believe in democracy. <laughs> You're running an oligarchy or something. Right. Uh, uh, there's probably some other better descriptor, which, uh, yeah, positions that kind of like relationship between the quote unquote masses and the, you know, the technocratic and right. expert cultures that organize responsibly the modern society, which is far too vast and complex for the everyday man to be able to actually weigh in on. Right. So this is the, the um, benevolent technocracy of right. the communication sciences is part of what led us to this Cass Sunstein's book, The Ethics of Influence, on the nudging effects and the ethical implications of nudging through social media. Right. He doesn't come to the conclusion that nudging is bad. <laughs> he comes to the conclusion that, in fact, certain forms of nudging are necessary to run yeah. a society as complex as ours. Um, so it becomes a quite an interesting philosophical issue and psychological issue about what are the precise psychological prerequisites for yep. an open society. Yep. <laughs> uh, are those achievable <laughs> yep. given current conditions of human socialization and biophysical uh, kind of like substrate? Right. Right. Uh, this and, is what I wanted to ask you. OK, so like yeah. so I'll, I'll throw this out there. My optimistic clinical side is, yes, is if everybody is given a particular frame, this is where their heart is. They have this capacity as long as they're contextualized and 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 there's a system is held. And then I will times get frustrated, elitist and everybody's a goddamn herd animal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, you know, that's, I don't really believe that, but sometimes I feel that. So in terms of now your experience and your vision about trying to give to the populace something very, very complicated and how they'll digest it, especially given the forces you're working against, the education developmental forces, the media forces, where, where's your heart in terms of the, oh, hold on. Yeah, no, I got you. It's interesting that the, you know, the notion of like the masses, right? Like the vast unwashed kind of masses, that very notion emerged with the idea of propaganda itself. Ah, well, there it is. Right? <laughs> and that they actually need one another. That once you've created a mass of anonymous people dependent upon an economic system who've been atomized and put into no culture and no community, they then need something like mm -hmm. propaganda to feel like they're a part of something. Okay. Um, and so the notion that we have that people f like maybe aren't capable of self-governance, right? Mm -hmm. That's in a, that's like a, a, maybe a useful side effect for, of the <laughs> right. creation of this form of social organization, which again, was a, it was intended to be a benevolent technocracy based on mm -hmm. early modern bad psychology. You know, not too far removed from eugenics and other things, uh, which basically portrayed a very reductionist, negative, almost anti-humanist vision of what people are. And that 
So the masses emerged as a, as almost like a form of propaganda itself, <laughs> that there is this thing, the masses, <laughs> right? right? right. Uh, and in fact, now I agree with your first, the clinical intuition, which is that, um, uh, you know, the potential that we don't know what the mm. human potential is actually <laughs> like, but we do know that, um, the possibilities for things like what PJ called formal operational thinking mm -hmm. or hypothetical, hypothetical deductive reasoning, um, what Habermas calls, uh, communicative action, which is action oriented towards reaching mutual understanding with another mm -hmm. person, not action oriented toward manipulating them. Yep. The whole point of my action is to reach mutual understanding with you, communicative action. We know those things Be are- a logos. Right, <laughs> exactly. No, totally. Habermas is right there. He's just mm -hmm. uh, a German. Uh... Right. So the, the point there is that um, those things are attainable in under normal conditions of socialization during adolescence. I mean, this is what most of human development has shown. What's so kind of like crazy <laughs> is that we actually have conditions of socialization that don't consistently bring people to those developmental levels and forms of identity uh, consistently enough and across enough domains of their lives. That's what's important to get. I'm not saying that we're not creating formal operators. We are just on very narrow lines of development so that they can actually be PhDs in mechanical engineering or something like that. And then just buy the propaganda bubble created by uh, right. one of the mainstream media outlets because they never studied political science, they never studied economics. Uh, you know, their parents were their first generation in college and their parents were actually racist. Like, so there's all of these things <laughs> that make it so that there's a, you can have, it's, so I'm not saying there's a gen, been a general suppression of cognitive capacity. I'm saying there's been a channeling and an instrumentalization yep. of it. Uh, and a little bit like Herbert Marcuse, like one dimensional man kind of critique here where I'm saying that there's a, the absence of skill is about not uh, pure complexity, but rather about the broadness across totally. the domains of the meta psychology, if you will. Um, so yeah, so that's important to get. So I'm optimistic. <laughs> I actually think as soon as people start taking themselves seriously, um, which doesn't mean taking the ideology someone tells you seriously, right? And then taking yourself seriously, <laughs> it means taking yourself seriously is actually able to judge. Uh, and take the time and respect the, the, the form and depth of inquiry that's actually necessary to participate um, and to realize that we don't actually have the resources to do it. That's the main thrust. One of the main thrusts of the Consilience Project is to begin to bring to bear some resources for people. Uh, and many of them are conceptual resources, but some of them will be curated actual web resources. <laughs> uh, and um, and once people begin to recognize how, I think through meta news analysis, through other things, how weak the existing media landscape is, uh, mm -hmm. then I think uh, there will be a new kind of demand created. Okay. And so there's a hope for a downward propagation into the, uh, the existing media landscape itself, which has not always been this way. No, no, the, no, the, the, I think, well, I mean, lots of institutions have lost faith and trust, but certainly I, my understanding is the faith and trust in the media, um, you know, has plummeted and the, the longing for this, I feel is right. deep. Uh, now this is, we, if there are other things in the consilience project you want to jump on, but it's, this is also an opportunity, uh, for us to veer into your brilliant analysis of meta psychology. Um, oh, nice. you talked Good. about the line of development. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's, there's more to being human, uh, than knowing molecular biology, uh, right. right. Um, so I'd love to explore your, um, frame heuristic developmental way of guiding us. And, and I'll take this opportunity to say, I sort of, I slide this line in at various junctures, uh, of, of the early part of these podcasts. And as, so overall, this is a dialogos. Uh, where we're searching or seeking a coherent naturalistic ontology uh, that can revitalize the human soul and spirit in the 21st century. Um, and I will say you're not too far from my thoughts uh, as I crafted that and given your wisdom and opportunity, uh, I'd love to hear 
uh, your thoughts some about you know your meta psychology. Meta psychology, totally. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, there's a it came out of actually an exploration of alternative ontologies in many ways. So I, I began, I was a cognitive psychologist and studied right. development psychology, Piaget and Vygotsky and that whole field and read very broadly in <clears throat> psychodynamic theory and, and, and things of that nature, cognitive psychology, et cetera, a long time meditator. Uh, but it was really with uh, Roy Bascar uh, mm. and Ken Wilber and other people who were actually and Charles Sanders Purse, people who were basically right. doing, met, they were doing metaphysics. Yeah. <laughs> that was where I started to look to be able to, to reorganize psychology, similar to the way you are trying to do. Like I was very dissatisfied with the field as such. Right. Not with particular like theories in the field, but like mm-hmm. the field. Like, this is an incoherent field of science was my sense. And, Amen, brother. Right, but when I started <laughs> to get these broader ontological frames, I started, oh, okay, I can place things in different uh, ontological buckets if you want to get really simple about it. And so that was the first, I started to do metapsychology in graduate school, but what now I called the metapsychology, <laughs> meaning my metapsychology is one that I codified much more, more much more recently. Um, right. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very similar to your efforts. I mean, that's what's so remarkable when we speak because we've basically both attempted to, for the sake of improving the care people can give to others, <laughs> reorganize the field of psychology and actually critique it, but also like rescue it from itself or something like that. Totally. Um, and so... Yeah, actually, it began with Charles Sanders' purse, and that's where I began. And actually, I think I'll just pause there and say, because I do think our situation, and I think John Verveke falls in the same basic category, Agreed. right? In the sense that we are, you know, I identi- I get trained as a behavioral scientist, I identify as a scientist, but I'm also then placed in the role of clinician and healer, you know, uh, right. watching psychological suffering uh, in the real world, connecting to that, feeling my own, feeling the ensoulment dynamic, wanting to be a wise healer in relation to that, and then wanting some architectural structure that would inform that, and then realizing when I asked psychology to do that, it was just shit at the incoherent level, right? I mean, it's just, it, it, just it, it falls completely down. And then your role as an educational philosopher, you know, your uh, identity as, as somebody who then is seeing the need for developmental socialization done with mentorship and care and that kind of thing. You know, and John's bridging between, you know, the, his Eastern philosophical traditions and the pragmatic philosophies of that and cognitive science. So I think it's a really interesting point that all three of us, which I think have very similar worldviews, are also bridging the theory in practice in particular uh, ways. And I really think you kind of need that to see what the problem was. Absolutely. And like I, I speak about the meta psychology as trying to find the languages, images, and symbols that psyche can use to speak to psyche <laughs> about itself and to heal itself, basically. And I speak about the three modalities where those things exist, you know, the, uh, the de- modality of development, the modality yep. of ensoulment, and the modality of transcendence. And yep. in each of those resides you know, tools for the caregiver, basically tools for the person who's trying to, the educator, you know, tools for the psychopomp, if you will, if you want to use the older language, right? Which is the the one who wants to lead along the full person towards a better state of being. Right. Um, Right. And, and, you know, so like in the developmental schema, you've got languages and cognition. And so you'd have, you know, schema change, right? Cognitive behavioral therapies where you're basically teaching people more complex, integrated ways to make sense of their lives. So that's like right. an example of the development. I throw Piaget and the model of hierarchical complexity and the majority of the work that I've done seriously as a psychologist in that bucket, in the development bucket. Um, in the insolvent bucket, which you could also call personality, uh, there the repertoire, it's not like cognition, it's a repertoire of images. And it's actually the place of dream work and the place of creative activity and the place of moving through stations of tragedy and interpersonal deepening Absolutely. and things of that nature. So this is where you put the depth psychological traditions and archetypal right. psychology and uh, things of that nature, um, which are 
not about improving the way you think per se, and not about becoming more complex in developmental levels, but about deepening into richer character, more integrity, um, and more specifically like an archetypally charged image of self, which yeah. sees self in universe. So that's like, and I, the core of everything I think is insolment, but that I'll return to that. Okay. And then transcendence, um, mm -hmm. this is where is the domain of consciousness and symbol uh, and awareness. And so this is the place where you get like Verveke's meditation practices, uh, mm -hmm. some forms of um, prayer practice, uh, certain forms of uh, dream work that are about identification of universal symbol. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that domain, you're looking at not working with emotion, personality, and uh, other stuff or language. You're looking at basically working with uh, the nature of awareness and consciousness itself. Um, so the witness, as it were, uh, right. among other modalities. So in those, those are the three buckets, basically. Right. And they contain many, many subfields within psychology, and then they relate. And so I propose, basically, that, um, like I said, uh, in Solman ends up being the primary. And then once you have a sense of self and a sense of image and motivation, it's only then do you move into the cognitive and through the symbolic and back. So there's a way to describe that, which is like that will be the footnotes to this conversation, which is just meant to be an overview. Right. But yeah, there's a sense that they're not just three distinct buckets. They're, they're actually part of a coherent way of understanding right. the psyche as a whole. Um, right. And then like any psychological meta psychology, it's useful for individual work. It's useful for organizing theory. It's also useful for doing sociocultural analysis yes um, very much. if you if you can kind of open it wider uh and so that's some of what informs the consilience project frankly at least uh from the vantage that i sit in the the where i'm at within it um the interesting thing about propaganda <laughs> uh is that it the use of image and symbol specifically uh that language, cognition, <laughs> these things are part of it for sure. But much of what's actually happening is uh, sometimes unconscious or pre-conscious. Uh, and it has to do with the loading of symbolic and fields and and the uh, manipulation of image and specifically the image of self and belonging and things of that nature. Yeah. Right. And for me, so when I talk about the revitalization of soul and spirit, so for me, I think that aligns very closely insolment uh, and the transcendent spirit, uh, you know, I think that the sort of enlightenment and the industrial capital system, you know, built procedural capital labor relations for development of skill sets in particular instrumental ways. But fundamentally what we lose in many regards is an adequate frame for our insolment, although certainly you get psychotechnologies, but they're not coherent and they are not effective at creating the kind of communities and ways of living and the way modern science undercuts the traditional philosophical, religious, theological frames, we really undermine a lot of our spiritual transcendence. And to me then the task, and this is why I love the meta psychology is like, we did pretty well on skill development, <laughs> but we got a lot of work to do on the others. And when we see the meaning crisis and depression and anxiety and all those other things, I think that's fundamentally a distorted a reflection of our distorted soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's right. It's not, and it's funny because I've been writing these papers on the education crisis also for the consilience project. And it's not that we, fail at education. We actually figured out really well how to do a very specific limited form of education, mm -hmm. which as you pointed out very astutely was coupled to this kind of like uh, instrumentalized uh, capital labor relationship um, and which you can't disentangle from the creation of the public schools in the modern nation state, you just can't. So so that's, that's basically the way to think about it. It's not, we're actually in some ways more sophisticated than humans have ever been. And in some ways building knowledge at a higher level and doing things that are just like almost science fiction level and superhuman. But in other ways, <laughs> we are actually way less mature and sophisticated in cultural, religious, and other expressions than we have ever been. 
there are pockets of the culture, especially in the West, uh, that are deserts of meaning, basically, but rich with highly complex, capacitated people in this other modality of education. So that, and that's what actually makes the situation so dangerous. If it was a full blown across the board education crisis, <laughs> uh, then we'd be in a situation of just the world civilization would be breaking down. Right. It would be obvious. Like we wouldn't be able to run the trains and build new computers and things, but it's because we've got a distorted lopsided developmental process underway, which has been noted. I mean, this is a common theme that our technologies have outpaced our morality right. and another way of saying that is that our techno-economic competencies skill sets have outpaced our our moral and ethical skill sets right, right. and that right. you know we're basically still medieval uh but with high technology <laughs> right. um and just because you can make high technology as i already mentioned doesn't mean you're not mm -hmm. going to be triggered like a medieval peasant when you read something in the New York Times, <laughs> oh. right? And so I think that- ends as, up, as evidence. <laughs> right, so I just think it's, and that's important to get. And so it's that it's of this lopsidedness and it's reflected, I think, characterologically across most people, many people can be experienced that way. Now, what's been interesting and Max Weber pointed this out that you're gonna have the, the kickback and then you're gonna have the people who reject cognition and who overemphasize either symbol or imagination right so this would be the art and hyper moralization of both fundamentalism and extreme i think postmodern like hyper aestheticization of discourse and politics right so this is the kind of the modernity builds the iron cage right. <laughs> and splits men apart into different types and you get the kind of like obvious technocratic benevolent leader who allows for the hippies to have woodstock even though the cia is surveilling everything and they know exactly what's happening right um so that sense of yeah the the splitting apart within the human and then the splitting apart within the human community of these value spheres these different types right. so that now the scientists can just ignore the religious guy right and the religious guy can just ignore the scientists and they can both ignore the crazy art scene <laughs> uh because there's no need to integrate those and um again I mean, this is just like straight habermas and weber right yeah. like they used to be fused in medieval right. times you know galileo wasn't allowed to look through them through the telescope <laughs> precisely because you know, morality and art and, and discourse about the world were fused. And so you break them apart, separation of church and state, a whole bunch of things that seem valid, but then as they go apart and then most of the resources get funneled into the one that's being the most successful, which is the kind of, you know, so-called hegemony of the techno scientific yep. stack, then you get in a situation of disproportionality. Oh. And so, whereas the prior cultural renaissances uh, that we know, the one immediately prior to our historical epoch, the Renaissance, <laughs> right. and the Enlightenment, as it were, as controversial as those are, uh, were mostly about kickstarting that techno-economic right. uh, prowess with some universalization of morality, but not with enough chutzpah, not compared to the science and technology, right? So the now needed cultural renaissance and enlightenment is not one of techno science. We've got the technology. Uh, right. It's one of rehumanization. Basically, it's one of a re re revitalizing of those domains of insolvent and transcendence, which means reworking with image and symbol, which means taking them back from the cultural industry and back from the politicians and back from the media and into community. Right. And, uh, you know, I've spoken about this with Verveke, like I'm a huge fan of movies. I'm not going to deny it, but the vast majority of archetypal frames that adolescents have to imagine their own identity come from products created to make money. Right. Adolescents used to get <laughs> their identity from shared community symbols that were part of the epistemic commons. They were part of what we agreed to be valuable thing to believe about oneself, not the thing that is guaranteed to get people in movie seats, right? Or to play video games and things, right? 
there's not denying that in some superhero movies like Black Panther or other ones mm -hmm. that there's not mind blowing archetypal like stuff being done. There is, <laughs> but the problem is that the medium is the message, and ultimately it is meant to be forgotten and replaced with the next one, not meant to be cultivated as part of a community practice of self understanding. And so this is about that primacy of image, primacy of ensoulment means you have to revitalize the epistemic commons across all of its domains, not just fixing the discourse about cognitive things, <laughs> but fixing the sensibilities we have about what are uh, appropriate ways to create the cultural resources that people have to understand themselves, basically. It's a long-winded way <laughs> of saying that there's a, yeah, there's an eventuality here where um, the current way we do culture begins to just break right. and cultural innovation starts to emerge. And I think this is maybe already be happening. Uh, that's just striking, you know, and we've talked about the emergence of new religious movements and things of that nature. Yep. Uh, and so that's gonna, I'm not saying it's gonna be a new religious movement, but it will have those qualities of re uh repotentiation of what Bard would call the symbolic order. Yep. Um, not the real or the imaginary, but the symbolic order. Uh, I've got Bard on tomorrow, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, he's right in this, man. Like yeah, he's, no, he's uh, oh. yeah. Anyway, and that so, so advertising and other things got to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're giving a, a, a talk uh, to the Build Own community, I think in May, right, on education. And you are helping us remember some leaders in education that may okay. seed us for thinking about education for the future. Mm, totally, yeah. May 8th, I think. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, the European Build Doom Day. They invited yep. a American to be the keynote speaker at European Build Doom Day. So I will make note of that. And well, you, you are one of the leading educational yeah. philosophers, Zach. <laughs> Apparently. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm speaking about John Amos Comenius. Uh, yes who, uh, yeah, as a figure I became quite captivated by, who most people don't know about, who's a very important educational. But I had never heard of him, so yeah. you know, whatever that says, but you know, there it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And, you know, I, I make the argument that basically Comenius, who many people argue was responsible for laying the conceptual foundations that led to the creation of the Royal Academy, which was the institution we associate most with the Enlightenment. Yep. Um, he was actually a deeply religious man and uh, uh, like a globe or European traveling educational reformer. But I make the argument, he, the reason that his ideas are so influential, even though he was just an educational philosopher, <laughs> which is what he was, maybe the first most important philosopher of education, he gave us the idea of the public school. He gave us the idea of don't beat kids. <laughs> he gave us the meaning like physically beat right, kids. Right. He gave us the idea. <laughs> don't beat them. Don't, don't be the kids. It's a very simple <laughs> idea. That's a pretty simple don't do, right. you know. Uh, and the idea. That. <laughs> and it was, I mean, that's what it was. They would make yeah. you, his day. There was no way. There was basically. I think it's one of the things that we've learned in psychology. Is, yeah, that's generally a bad idea. It's generally a bad idea. Yeah. There's relative consensus. That's right. <laughs> and that's how it was. It was like, mm -hmm. there was no public school. If you were going to a school, you were taken out of some kind of agrarian community or village, <clears throat> put in basically a monastic educational context. Then you'd go to the monastery, or you'd go to be in the bureaucracies of the royal courts. Mm. And uh, they'd give you obscure Latin and obscure Latin grammar. And if you got it wrong, they would beat you. Like literally to the point of like. Right. So we complain about the schools today, but you know, things. Right. So we have communities to thank for stopping those kinds of literally barbaric right. practices, but also for other things, <clears throat> developmentally appropriate education. He had a sense that at each different age, there's a different curriculum. Really? He also had the sense that lifelong learning is appropriate. So he actually has curriculum go all the way through adulthood to death. And he actually had a school of death where the culture has a responsibility to provide the education necessary to allow someone to die well. Uh, and he had the school of infancy where he was the first person to recognize that the mother <laughs> is actually the most important node in this whole educational system that we're building, oh, right? So incredibly, 
remarkable. He was like, had a neo perennial philosophy that would unify religions and eventually articulated this thing of a uh, universal reform where the educational reform efforts were part of a broader planetary hmm. civilizational reform effort. And what's important to get here is that he, I make the argument he was living in a similar time to ours. He was living right. in the transition between the ancient regime of the medieval feudal empires and the divine right of kings to the what we call the modern age of capitalism and the nation state. He was living in that time between worlds. Literally during the 30 years war, his house was burned down. He lost two wives. He had to flee. He had to hide his, bury his books just because of the widespread violence. And what you have to get here is that, again, back to this beginning, Europe was self-propagandizing itself in the 30 years war. The term propaganda was created. Is that, is that early 17th century? What's the, what do you remember? So, you know, 1630s. Through, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what exactly. And uh, I could be a little bit off on that, but it's that period. No, I'm, just, that's, I'm the, no historian, but I want my timeline. Yeah. So I just, yeah, the, you know, the Inquisition but, and the witch yeah. trials, mm-hmm. and the 30 right. years war, and the, the, so, the ramifications of the Protestant Reformation and the existence of the printing press led mm. to the massive propagation of pamphlets and books from Protestants versus Catholics, yep. where they so, basically convinced the one another that the opposite side were evil, like yep. as evil as could possibly be. Yep. And the Vatican created the term propaganda. It was, hmm. it was a religious oh, term uh, that was used to talk about propagating, you know, the, okay. and so in that context, you had the Protestants and Catholics self-propagandizing to the extent where no one wanted to actually talk. Somebody gets thrown out a window famously and the 30 years war begins. And it was one of the most sometimes considered to be the actual first world war. It's like the great tragedy of Europe. Like the, the um, carnage is ridiculous. Uh, and so it's in that context that Comenius is hatching these crazy concrete utopian ideals for an education centric society and specifically even an invisible college of scholars who are like, hey, you're all self propagandizing yourselves. There's this thing called natural science, which was discovered maybe by the Greeks and maybe during the Renaissance or something. And there's this thing called like the, you know, uh, the unity of all religion and like all of these crazy ideas that wow. were emerging from the, after the Renaissance, before the enlightenment, right? This is that. Right, right, right. That'd be right. In, yep. That'd be between the, the Renaissance and the enlightenment. And it's Comenius shepherded that through. And then his key supporters ended up again, convening in Great Britain and creating the Royal Society, you know, Leibniz, for example, of course. Leibniz, uh, loved Comenius's work, wrote a lot about Comenius, as did Descartes. So he's one of these figures. He was a major player in the game at the time. Now, here's what gets interesting. He was a devout religious man. He was a a bishop in an order, uh, the Bohemian Brethren. And his childhood friend was a soothseer. uh, And all rumors of Rosicrucianism and all kinds of crazy things are circling around Comenius and his friend who's making prophetic predictions about the victory of the Protestants and Mm. return of the king to Bohemia and things of this nature. So he associated himself and endorsed and published (laughs) the prophetic visionary uh, aspects of his friend's work, which was not uncommon in the day. Right. But a little, a little out of step with Boyle and Descartes <laughs> and others who are going to be doing this whole science thing. So by the time it took off, uh, Comenius had died. Immediately after his death, his visionary friend says, I made it all up and joined the Catholic Church. And so within a generation, right. his image was smeared, basically. And they took the ideas and ran. Uh, And it's only actually relatively recently, frankly, that outside of like Czechoslovakia and some other places um, that you had, because that's where he was from, uh, that that you even had anyone really studying Comenia. So there's been a little bit of, in the mess since the 90s, the Renaissance, at least in the English language, of Comeniology, because it's like a vast, it's a vast corpus (laughs) of of work uh, in Czech. Um, And anyway, so that's the Comenia story, which I will tell some version of in like 10 or 15 minutes at the, at the Bildung day. But he was the, he was the one who essentially 
I believe probably first coined the notion of Bill Doom. And then you have oh. Goethe oh. and Humboldt and others who are inspired by him. Okay. And it's important to get that the Bill Doom has within it the word image. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the way Comenius held it was that actually it's about the shaping of oneself in the image of God. It was God. about the self image and the transformation of self image. Um, and so that was why he was such a radical optimist. Like, even though he's looking at basically what would look like civilizational collapse, it's right. a war of all against all. It's information war where everyone's accusing everyone else of being evil. And if you don't join mine, you go to hell and hell keeps getting worse and worse. Like in the books, hell keeps getting scarier and scarier because you're trying to incentivize people to join your side. Right. Uh, and there's political machinations and it's just a nightmare. The famine, torture, I mean, it's crazy. And yet he's still just radically optimistic in part because he knows that the power of the human to shape self in image of God. Hmm. Like it was a profound, devout faith he had that basically the, uh, that the Christ-like potential for the human was possible. Basically it was right. convenient. So that would be the other reason that when the enlightenment got going, they're like, no, 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 no. he was great, but let's not, <laughs> let's not bring along right. all of these well, religious fair. trappings. Um, and I think that is, so I see like a fork in the road. Like we yep. could have gone the Comenian modernity, mm. which would have had the techno science and something like a perennial philosophical view of a world spirituality. Right. Uh, but instead we just took the techno science and we dropped investing just in much, as much time and energy into the development of our moral and ethical and religious symbols and images and enculturation devices. Yep. Um, right. So, yeah. so that was his vision was that was of a, yep. uh, you know, for lack of a better term, an integral, uh, mm. an integral enlightenment. Um, what we got was a partial one. Uh, yeah. And so this is a little bit like historical reconstruction, but it is in some sense, something I've been piecing together to make sense of our own time uh, right. and to make sense of my own intuition that actually the educational dynamics here are at least as important, if not more important, I, th- I would say more important than the technical yep. and economic ones that right. they're prior. Right. If we don't solve the education problem, we're sure as hell not going to solve those complicated technical problems. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. I mean, I, I totally see, you know, at some level they're, they're sort of the edge of the system waking up at some level, right? And they're sort of like, oh my God, there's global civilization, at least endangerment, if not collapse, high risk elements, massive amounts of change that's creating flux. And then the, you know, there needs to be some sort of invisible college waking up to that, that then translates the bridging to give us some sort of grounding that connects the pa- wisdom of the past and the crazy future that we are dealing with. And then somehow develop the next generation along those lines, you know? Uh, and, and that's the big, and that's the great educational question of how do we socialize kids we're then going to live. I mean, what the hell the world's going to be 20, 30 years from now, Zach? I mean, what, what kind of technology are you going to have? I don't think we know with any degree of clarity, the digital virtual worlds, like the print, printing press on steroids. Yes. Right. So, uh, you know, from a TOK perspective, fifth joint point shit here, it's a whole new information processing communication network. So it's almost as big as us talking, <laughs> you know, right. it's like in that kind of right. level of, of potential, at least. Right. Right. Uh, so, no, so now we're in like, great. you know, how the hell do we, so, you know, be so now we have to sort of socialize our kids yep. and we're like talking apes from whatever the hell. No, that's exactly right. And that's the, the, <laughs> the problem. The There's a problem with my analogy to the long end of the long 16th century uh, and that whole period with Comenius, right? Which is that that's one kind of historical epoch shift, right? Um, And I think that that is, that that analogy works. But if this is not just a historical epoch shift, but an evolutionary epoch shift, which is what you're arguing, which is to say, this is a little bit more like (laughs) we're leaving the savanna and beginning to build like technologies and have communities with linguistically mediated communication for the first time, that the emergence of joint attention, propositionally differentiated speech and intergenerational transmission, which would be the cluster that I would say is the sapiens cluster of species specific traits. Uh, 
that something akin to that. This is, this is not just a generational shift, that it's a speciation moment. Something well, like the that. medium's the message. And what the, what the tree of knowledge says is, hey, it was genes and cells. They did one thing. Brains and behavior, they did another thing. Language did another thing. And now this digital virtual interface with our techno, you know, artificial and human intelligence crossbreeding and interfacing and the acceleration of that. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're sort of on the right at the Cambrian explosion of jellyfish and the, you know, complicated animals. I mean, it's like, I don't know what the hell it's going to look 50 years from now, but it's like uh, complicated. That's for, to say well, I mean, it is. And then the question of how, you know, what, what does that feel like to go through a moment of speciation as a self-aware being? It's kind of a disorienting question. <laughs> like, and what's interesting. Take two and call me in the morning. We'll that's that. that's <laughs> That's my meta psychological doctor prescription. Yeah. Well, and there's and there's like uh, honestly, I think there's a sub there's an awareness in the broader culture that something like this is up. That's what's so interesting. So like when you read the techno optimists uh, uh, who basically are trying to do away with the notion of free will uh, mm -hmm. and replace it with some notion of control, either through AI or the implants or whatever it is. Um, like that's that's remarkable because that's an example of, we would be a different species if we relinquished the, even the phenomenological experience of self-awareness, right? Which I mean, the phenomenological experience of, of free will. So there's even in the space of concepts and like academic conversation, we're having people targeting that notion of the human as we've known it. And again, yeah. like, I think of the quote by Foucault, who was like a, you could argue like an anti-humanist, right? A lot of postmodernism, a lot of postmodernism is actually anti-humanist. Uh, and what you end up getting is uh, a lot of it's very important to say that, but a lot of it's also anti-human. And what he's getting is there's that notion is like humanity or man is a name written on the sand, basically. And the tide's coming in, basically something yeah. like that. And the argument being that uh, precisely this definition of the human that emerged post Comenius, uh, and possibly even this notion of the human that emerged like post Bronze Age or something, yep. uh, is beginning to change. Uh, yep. And what's interesting is that, so there's the techno-optimist transhumanists, right? Who seem like they want us to just join the Borg. Yep. Then you have the, what I would call like the world spirituality, religious transhumanists mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Tilliard de Chardin yep. or Sri Aurobindo uh, and mm -hmm. others. And that's interesting too, because they're saying there's more than one way to stop being a human. You don't mm -hmm. have to basically join and merge with the uh, Borg, <laughs> right. right? That if we if we have a different kind of ontology, for example, right. uh, mm -hmm. totally. we begin to realize that some of the things we associate with being human uh, have been associated with certain kinds of limits in uh, socialization, communication, yep. power, energy transformation, which is to say converting the energy of the sun into like kinetic power. And so there's okay. another way to think about it, which is that we're not becoming less human, ant-like, like matrix, like, you know what I'm saying? Like that is yeah, one yeah, vision, yeah. Right? right? The other one is it more like that we're actually becoming something more like gods, like little gods. Um, this is the way Bhaskar articulated it. Yep. And, uh, and so that's different. It's very different. Uh, totally. And not no less disconcerting potentially. Well, <laughs> it's going to be a transition on, regardless. <laughs> if, if you read the literature on on gods, uh, especially the Greek literature, it's not it's not pretty. Uh, right, Plato, especially if it doesn't come with a little bit of wisdom and humility. <laughs> this is now you're getting it right now you're getting it. So like, we do not need wisdom and humility if we go to the matrix and join the Borg. Right. But if we have an image of a future where there's more sovereignty, more empowerment, right? More information, more choice making capacity uh, that we need wisdom and responsibility and a whole bunch of other things that have to do with uh, installment <clears throat> dynamic. Um, if we go the other way, then the benevolent 
technocracy only needs the kind of logical and strategic yep. you know engineering knowledge that would allow the matrix to keep running right uh, and so in that context and this is what Yuval Harari points out you do have an emergent other species mm -hmm. who are godlike who control the rest <laughs> and he calls that homo deus right yes I know. Um, where you actually they 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 remove themselves both economically mm -hmm. and biophysically which is yep. to say through uh, you know, life extension technologies and yep. innovations. They remove themselves from the rest of us <laughs> yep. and then work back down benevolently, technocratically to right. you know, keep the farm, uh, keep the farm exactly. running. In, uh, right. In fact, I, I stopped eating pigs after he, because <laughs> in that book, he says, well, how do we look at one level beneath us? And, and I literally became a Turkitarian after those eight pages of, of the description of the way we eat pigs, which yeah. still hurts me every time I, like, I was sort of in denial about that, I think. And so that was an interesting move. Yeah, so all of this is exactly like this bridging. And I look back and I'm just, you know, my own journey on this sort of the, everybody thought it was pretty weird when I called it the tree of knowledge originally. But actually, in retrospect, that has emerged into a garden, you know, um, then that calling to bridge the science with a religion that's not a religion at some level, you know, <laughs> the calling to restore the whole of the human from the techno developmental skill into an ensoulment and a spiritual transcendence that's somewhat grounded in naturalism at one level, but affords us the hope of the possibility of the liminal space, you know, mm. at the least, at the minimum, <laughs> if not actually shined back on by some ontological entity, um, but at least in relationship to our own ontology, um, that's absolutely, to me, that's absolutely essential for the architecture of the kind of uh, place we find ourselves in. Totally. No, I completely agree. Yeah, the, the, the notion of the religion that's not the religion is interesting. And that's kind of what I was meant by like neo-perennialism or the world's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right, that there's uh, there are aspects of symbol and image that come from the religious traditions, and again back to Habermas, that have uh, untapped semantic potential, uh, which cannot be replaced in the creation and protection of vulnerable communities. It's almost totally. exact Habermas quote there, but that's the idea basically, and yep. that doesn't mean like. Oh, now we become <laughs> fundamentalist, really. Like, and that again, that's a straw man argument that's made by a kind of reactive, reductive, materialist, secularist. When in fact, uh, to look at the religious traditions uh, in that dismissive a way is it's it's just kind of insulting to the vast majority of the world's population. So, uh, whereas in fact, what we're doing is continually mining these rich cultural resources and sometimes misinterpreting, right? Like. Mm -hmm violent <laughs> fundamentalism uh, and sometimes rediscovering reimagining what's still left untapped within them and so that means that yeah it's a religion that's not a religion because it's not a religion the way it was previously practiced which was right. that mind's the only one that's right and right. there's a tremendous amount of literal interpretation uh, and again Comenius had already in a sense, seen beyond that, trying to see beyond that. And then you get the perennialist movement, which is very interesting, Huxley and, and others. Um, and you're, you're left with, yeah, there's a core set of not specific symbols, but kinds of symbols, right? Not specific images, but kinds of images, totally. which seem to be necessary resources for identity and community creation, but not necessary resources for skill acquisition <laughs> necessarily right and that's the idea um totally. did, so did yeah. you are you are you familiar with uh, uh oslan's uh, god a human history mm -hmm. uh, so anyway i i know there's some skepticism about this but he makes a really powerful argument that um uh continues to cultivate my syntheism <laughs> from bard totally. okay which is uh syntheism you know the god we create or my belief in the concept of God is the way I put it. I totally believe the concept of concept God. Of God. <laughs> right. Right? Nice. You know? It's right. both real and and the Aslan argument is this, is that um, he does some uh, work in the Gobli Tech Tempe in Turkey, one of the oldest civilizations and a few others. And he argues that what we, at least from that kind of archeological interpretation, he argues that actually what's happening is larger and larger temples are being built. Okay, 
um, as, as the archetypal symbol of whatever religious meaning making structures. And as they get larger and larger, you can't nomadically re regulate them anymore. I mean, you can't uh, manage them through horticulture, but the nature of the task of the temple requires you to be there year round, okay? So in other words, our need for the symbol of God gives rise to the birth of agriculture is the right. argument. Okay. So then the whole transition from our oral indigenous into civilization itself could have been motivated ultimately by the quest of the symbol of God. Right. And if that's really cool, if that's true, then it's like, well, you know, you know, I mean, the, whatever atheistic assumption you have, the, the, the signature of sort of the quest for civilization may be found in that. Um, yeah. And that's very interesting. To me, that's like weird. You know, well, and you can take it one step further and say that same quest, yeah. the same quest for realizing the symbol or concept of God, is what's creating artificial intelligence right now. Yeah. Well, right. This, this is the driver, um, and uh, although a different, <laughs> not even formally known, but when you look at the language used to put the goals of some of these projects in perspective, it ends up being hard to differentiate from the kinds of okay. things that would have been attributed to the probably the god that was <laughs> the focus of those very first cities. But, but the Borg analogy is what's so scary because if what's happened is we cut the analogy of our wisdom traditions, create a materialistic flatland that then is obsessed with power and then creates the technological god with no installment and no spiritual container. Yeah. That's not good. <laughs> I mean, the, the good news about that is that it will break. Yeah, well, because it's a complicated system, right? And it will break because it is ignoring two thirds of the material that it's operating on, yeah. uh, which is to say, if it's operating on the psyche and you're ignoring two thirds of it. It's only going to last so long. I don't know how long, but that would break um, yeah. probably catastrophically as our civilization is breaking right. because we've been ignoring for so long, <laughs> right? Essential things that are necessary to keep it going. And uh, yeah. again, many critical theorists have mentioned that that. They, it undermines the conditions of its own possibility. Like yep. capitalism needs you to be a responsible mother and send your kids to school, right? But then capitalism eats away at your possibility for being a responsible mother, <laughs> uh, right? It needs you to inculcate the moral ethos of be an upstanding citizen to your child and then it eats away at your ability to, to do that. Fragmenting your attention, longer work hours, daycare, media telling you what to think, like all of these things, not realizing that eventually you will <laughs> destroy the substrate you need for the, specifically the psychological substrate you need for the thing to keep operating. So right. that kind of analogy in a much more dystopian scenario explains why the Borg would eventually break. Yep. Um, right. So, and it would be, of course, resisted massively by humans. That's the other thing to remember. Like we're not, uh, we're not in the board yet. <laughs> yep. like, Actually, that reminds me. I wanted to ask you, uh, at least you know, uh, in terms of certainly before we go, I wanted to circle back around to this, and that is, you talked about the psyche, and and I mm -hmm. definitely wanted to make sure we had a little time for us to dialogue about that complicated word. <laughs> so I'd love to get your take when you use that word. When I use the word but, psyche. Yeah. yeah and I, it's funny because remember in Solman's primary in my model, yeah. so I use the word psyche yeah. with the full connotation um, of soul, basically. Yep. Uh, and that the, so psychology uh, interpreted as analysis of the mind, I think it's fine. And we can get into Aristotle on the mind, and which yeah. is actually on psyche. And so we'll see what, how the translation, but what I signal by using the word psyche instead of using the word mind yep. is that I believe the word mind tends to have a cognitive connotation Clear. that the mind is cognating, that the mind is the conscious witnessing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, be mindful. Um, right, for example, whereas I'm signaling with psyche that it's actually more, much more complicated, um, okay. that it includes actually transpersonal dimensions specifically. And that's what's so interesting uh, about the psyche as opposed to your mind. Now, group mind is a thing, but the, 
the psyche as conceived, uh, even by Jung, was not yours or mine, <laughs> right? Uh, and the psychology wasn't, in a sense, an analysis of your or my psychology. It was analysis of this deeper fabric yes. of shared experience, really, mm -hmm. both you and mine, and then, of course, with the whole history of our ancestors and all of that. So, yep. so I'm trying to actually load the concept a lot to, yep. to signal, basically, that, you know, uh, a lot of psychology is just focused on the mind and even more specifically, as you know, focused on some weird little <laughs> spot within the mind. And then they think they found something there and they may have, but it's a finding. And without a meta psychology, what are you going to do with it? Well, you're going to blow it out of proportion and you're going right. to pretend that it explains everything. <laughs> shit, shit. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to disrupt the no, little, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. With the so, yeah. so for me, when I hear it, my, my biggest affiliation and affinity is to the Aristotle, Aristotle's version of the layers of psyche and nature, um, right. you know, the exactly. vegetative layer, which I then want to break off and say is that's sort of like biological cognition, biological intelligence, whatever the intelligence mm -hmm. of plants and cells, right. um, you know, and then you get the sensitive motor soul, uh, you know, right. and for me, then that's where basic, the basic animal mental psyche is, um, mm -hmm. which then sets the stage for the way animals behave as agents in arenas. And then very early, I think it's the animal brain, kingdom you get the emergence of sentience the, the capacity to feel pleasure and pain you know down in insects probably um things like that and then that's really laying the groundwork for the base of my basic psychology and then that climbs up through the comparative psychology of the animal kingdom and then something else happens when you get into the reflective you know right. first there's that shared social and then narrating now you get a human psychology and the human sciences yeah. Exploding along those lines. And that's and that's my connotation too, to Aristotle and to Plotinus, who similarly had a full, mm. like a full stack model of the psyche, which went transpersonal. So it's like mineral actually is first, <laughs> uh, mineral vegetative, uh, you know, basically mammalian, early human, late human, and then you start to get the non-human transpersonal archetypal realms basically right um, the different uh what's called the elohim right so like the choir yes. the choir of higher order intelligences which yeah. when you say something's coming through me this is what people are talking about yeah. and so that becomes very interesting and of course ken wilbur and others start to speculate right that you can actually push human capacity if we don't assume the mind is intradermal right. but understand right. the psyche as something right. more yeah. then you that's, start that's then well that's spiritual right exactly I mean, you know, exactly then you start to get into I mean, spiritual development basically totally. and in fact i mean the part of the whole i quad coin which i handed right. you right it totally. is, has some of the platinus <laughs> you know oneness yes. and then the whole notion and relationship to that to yes. climb okay. up to that and then and to me, then the issue of the you know, the kairos of the moment is like, can we generate a collective intelligence that we can awaken quickly to and start getting resonant right. frequency around? Totally. Right? Well, and and all the way down and all the way up. So like the it's important to get the like, and this is Rudolf Steiner's work, like mineral, plant, mammal, like those things are in you now. Yeah, actually. totally. Um, and he used to say like, you share with the mineral kingdom everything you can see. Right. Like you share with the animal kingdom, everything that reproduces, right. You share with the, excuse me, the plant kingdom, you share with the plant kingdom, everything that reproduces, you share with the animal kingdom, everything that feels right. So there's a, there's a compound psyche stack within the human. Wilbur called it the compound individual. Right. And so some of like mindfulness and embodiment practices and other things you find in esoteric traditions, and even in some forms of like contemporary health <laughs> and fitness stuff is actually going back down and reclaiming uh, those prior forms of psyche, which are Absolutely. actually within you, right? So like, uh, and people know that who do athletics, that there's an intelligence that the body has, yep. which if precisely if you try to, to bring your cognitive mind down into it, you're going to mess it up. Like, yeah. And so that that's very important to get to that. The, and, and this is a point Ken made back in the 80s, like Ken Wilber. Often you have to go back down and reclaim that stuff before you can go up and, and into the deeper insolvent and spirituality. And I think one of the main kind of limits on that kind of cultural awakening, if you will, mm -hmm. is the 
disconnect we have from the, actually the lower order intelligence it's not the higher order intelligence because we can all get drugs or whatever and, and find ways to do whatever like but the question is when you come back are you centered <laughs> like where you are in your body with yeah. the people you love uh yep. and are you responsible to the mammalian realities and basically what Steiner would call etheric or plant totally. realities of the body which are real i'm sure and uh different forms of movement practice. Um, when I do the, when I do the calm thing, I do calm body. Okay. So that's right. feeling into the groundedness of the body and the biology. Mm -hmm. I don't really go to minerals, but maybe I should. <laughs> I go to physiology, right? Calm heart. That's the sort of the primate. Okay. That's the socio-emotional field. Mm -hmm. How I feel right. emotionally, right. how I feel in relation, what's my relational value, belonging, that kind of thing. Calm mind. I mean, I don't normally, but really mind three, that's my justifying. Mm. Okay. And then calm spirit, what's my transcendent purpose, be a good ancestor, what do I va ultimately value? Right. And so yeah. there's the alignment, the, that stack yeah. in psychotherapy. And, and yes, that looping and the grounding and the push down and mm. up with coherence. When I hit my little wisdom energy, the wisdom energy was <laughs> definitely a felt down and up. And it was right. really weird and cool. You know, no, totally. If you want to feel your minerals, just find a way to feel your bones, basically. Mm. And if you sit Zen long enough, you learn to sit in the posture where you're 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 carried by the carriage of your bones, basically. Okay. Like the actual yeah. right. physiology of, of the skeletal structure. You learn to like feel and you can feel the gravity. And so then that's one way to be in touch with the mineral. Uh, um, yeah. So so it's, yeah, so all of that is is very real, and of course, the psychology has poked around at it. What's weird is that the ancients kind of saw it, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't nearly um, to the state of articulation that you get when you have to put into this mix the biological sciences yep. <laughs> and and uh, compare it to psychology, psychoanalysis, and all these things. So the trick is to organize those well and to know when different ones in different positions in that stack are overreaching their claims, like when is the evolutionary comparative psychologist generalizing to human behavior what they shouldn't, right? When are we anthropomorphizing monkeys and stuff? <laughs> Which happens if you watch, I can't even watch nature documentaries because it's just this, you know, zero sum game well, right. projected back <laughs> on nature. And so there's those methods. And so that's the trick with any meta psychology is like, once you lay out something like that stack or something like the different modalities, then you get to have that delicate, more delicate work of like, okay, this specific claim <laughs> by this specific comparative psychologist doesn't seem right, you know, and totally, and that becomes very interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that's always, I mean, for me, that was a transition in 1996 when I captured the angle on the culture person justification dynamic, but that right. just gave me this grasp of oh this human person culture evolutionary language reason giving narrative thing right. <laughs> and totally. now i have a you know, you know analysis of variance to put in our behavioral yep. science or if i can pull that thing out and then have it then in dynamic relationship to my primate you know animal self and right now all of a sudden that that affords a lot of clarity that that psychology had didn't wasn't no, clean totally on. and separating those is key <laughs> and then reintegrating and then like reintegrating exactly. the game. primate Re person totally primate right primate. totally yeah no the reason giving justificatory system stuff some of my favorite parts of the work I have to say like and I've told you about Robert Brandon and mm -hmm. uh, yes I, I right uh, exactly and Habermas takes the same view inferentialist semantics basically and it's that notion that what's the humans the, the reason actually when you look at it so many I mean at some levels so many people take the particular angle you know right. it's an unbelievably yep. powerful angle the evolutionary angle I was able to take and yoke it into Freud and psychology right. allowed for yeah. a particular kind of popping, but many people, of course, have, mm. this is yeah. not, uh, you know, Aristotle's, well, we're the rational animal at one level that goes right. way the fuck back. Right. Well, and, and to bring it back to the media, like if you look at a family system dynamic where there is systematically distorted communication of the justificatory system, right? Uh, yeah. That is a psychopath, like it's going to create psychopathology basically. Yeah. And so now you can imagine my analogy. <laughs> like, so it's so important to realize that like, reasons matter and the violations of laws and reason actually have like downstream propagation to mammalian effects. So like the experience, the experience of being misunderstood 
yep. systematically the experience of being so of speaking the truth and having the truth denied the experience of making a reasonable argument and it not mattering and being treated as if language has no power these things are distinctly human forms of violence basically uh, which creates psychopathology um, totally. and as the culture continues to continues to self propagandize <laughs> these things start to become part of the experience that people have. You go on social media, you see that I made this long, reasonable argument <laughs> and someone just dismisses it because we're in a place where actually arguments don't matter. And so like, that's very bad. Like if you, the justificatory system is not a trivial creation of the enlightenment, like this is actually has existed since we've been humans, all cultures oh, absolutely. have been, having reasons for what they do and sharing the reasons with one another and having better or worse reasons for what they do and wanting to justify, wanting you to justify action. Right. And so, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, so I just wanted to, yeah, I wanted to underline that because I'm such yeah. a fan of that notion and pulling that out and then showing that, okay, it, it comes out, there's like a space of reasons, but it's in your brain, man. So like if you start to act irrationally, I'm going to get super, like the mammalian part of me is going to start to get really. really? Yeah, polyvagal activation. I mean, exactly. that, that's what that does is it tracks, hey, we're in the same justification. It's open, it's safe versus big. Nope. Yep. And then, I mean, then that's like, you're not justified or we're tracking. And yep. then it's a totally psychophysical reality that is yep. all exactly. the way down in that stack. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's just very important to get. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's a form of realism, which is what's yeah. interesting, which is to say, like, um, you know, the attunement we have to ethical realities is as real as the attunement we have to, let's say, gravity, right? Totally. But it, we create context where we don't get as rapid feedback for violating those, <laughs> right? So, like, if you violate gravity, you're going to know it, you know? Like, whatever your building will fail or mm -hmm. you won't fly when you yep. try to jump off the roof or whatever. Right. But when you start to violate these norms of discourse, you start to violate norms of interpersonal relation and reciprocity and these things in certain institutional contexts and specifically on social media, I believe. People go way, 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 way too deep <laughs> into simulations that don't contradict those yeah. and becomes a uh, yeah, disorienting, again, kind of dangerous situation where we're not in tune with things that are, they're not, the, the point here is that they're not social constructs. Right. <laughs> like these are things that hit as real as physical objects, but it's language and orientation, perspective, intention, a whole bunch of stuff that constellates the, the field of interpersonal. Relations. Totally. I mean, the, the history is, you know, like Michael Tomasello tracks us, you know, yes. the history is we form shared attention, shared intention, you know, attention, intention together, create a inter, an implicit intersubjective dance. Then we start talking in the real world that we're prepared for. We live together. We're brothers together, right? right. On the land, dealing with mammoths, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. that's most of our time. Yeah. And, and, the, and then everything I say and everything you say lives in a particular context and we're held accountable in particular ways and right. we're connected, right? Now, I mean, the evolution of technology and now the social media, unbelievably, I can be a completely anonymous troll, right? And right. just turn myself with no accountability, no eye to eye contact, no over history, justify anything in some space out there. Right. Um, and how, especially if you're you know, an adolescent or all of us, but especially if you're an adolescent whose identity is forming in these particular contexts, right. I mean, this is why it's an unbelievable experiment. Our entire system, the mismatch between what might be going on <laughs> Right. What was, you know, what we're designed for, right. it's uh, not good potentially. No, totally. And it's, it's very important to see that, that difference between those contexts of socialization and how historically speaking, unusual the last century has been in terms of conditions of right. socialization. And it's back to the notion of like the notion of the masses totally. and the notion of propaganda merged together. And yeah. the, mass, yeah. the masses are those who are precisely not brothers in the field dealing with common realities, right? <laughs> right? They're, right. they're dissociated from one totally. another. And even and when they're- you, yeah. Anybody that doubts that, of course, all you need to do is just, what is it like to talk to somebody face to face, right? right. <laughs> Put somebody in a room and then yeah. have that conversation versus the, right. and just everyone will feel it. 
because the yeah. whole embodiment, and that's what we've allowed to do. So it is a very, very dangerous, um, and we have to then, Zoom may kind of be a counterbalancer at some level, you know, uh, I think, because what it's not, we're not in the same room, but man, we at least, we're so facially, visually trackers, right. you know, yeah. in conversation, we do so much with our face, as Zoom right. at least grants us that and places yeah. uh, dialogue in much more readily accessible right. form. Yeah, it's better than, better than asynchronous text. By Definitely better than, than yeah. tweeting. Right. No, I mean, <laughs> probably the worst. And again, and, and, and the whole point is not like we're doomed, like in one sense, no, no, we absolutely. will be. But the idea is that as you become more aware, it's like psychology, you diagnose problems before you fix them. So the idea here is that we need to see how bad it actually is before we can actually galvanize the, the way to move forward. Like I was asked yesterday, I was on this call with all these, uh, they were like a, community of unschoolers they're like undo, ah. doing unschooling and homeschooling right they like were, peter gray's work peter yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. and they asked me like <clears throat> well what are the things parents can do to protect their children basically and it's, like, well, it's an interesting question because you're presuming that the children need to be protected and i think i think they do <laughs> and so i said the, the i can't give you specific advice but i can say that the first thing we need to do is raise awareness that we're actually in a situation where kids need to be protected <laughs> like from you know, I'm not like, not from like, I'm saying from the screens, <laughs> right? From the culture to a certain extent, uh, from being put in situations of socialization that will be almost inevitably creating psychopathologies, right? Uh, and, uh, and so in that sense, when we're saying how dangerous it is and how messed up it is, and like, this is the idea we need to actually be on alert. It's like with Silent Spring, like, it's like someone had to say, guys, <laughs> like, this is how bad it actually is to begin to galvanize some support. Now that the trick for the people who want to kind of like begin to fix the problems in the epistemic commons is that we saw what happened in the environmental movement. Right. right. It got co-opted essentially. And you yeah. had you had basically what the greenwashing basically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and right now the fact checking industry is the equivalent of that <laughs> for the epistemic crisis, which is the same, call it a simple problem, just car carbon offset it, baby. It's a simple problem. It's actually a complicated problem, not a complex problem. We'll solve it with these greenwashing solutions, not with a radical actual change. So similarly, the risk here is that we raise the alarm about the epistemic problem, which is happening. Oh, there's misinformation. There's right. Yep, yep. What we're going to do, is we're going to fact check it all. Right. <laughs> uh, that's not a solution like at all. Um, and right now the fact checking infrastructure is basically just an extension of the existing media infrastructure, right. reconfirming its biases and polarization lines. Um, so one thing that needs to take place when people start to identify as being responsible for the epistemic commons, the way one can be responsible for the, the environment, right? Like an environmentalist. Yep is we need to get innovative <laughs> thinking about what the movement and the organization mm. ends up looking like. Um, yeah. And it may be, be, it may be because we're working on the root problem, which is to say the reason the ecological crisis could get co-opted was because of the sense-making crisis in, mm. in the news media specifically. <laughs> yep. right? mm -hmm. So if we're working on that problem, it's both more difficult because there's this weird reflexivity, <laughs> but it's also, the key to potentially mm -hmm. unlocking a lot more potential more rapidly. Um, right. So, so that's me trying to kind of like yeah. bring some sense of like we're trying, we're cobbling together right. and again, distributively, emergently, precisely without a leader that can be co-opted. Right. Some right. Or, or specific one org that can be co I like, like mm -hmm. it all needs to move together. Yeah, right. Somehow. So, so maybe as we bring this to nearing a close, can, can you give a horizon of your hope for the Consilience Project? Like what would be, uh, what's your kind of vision for how it might unfold and what uh, I'm sure be difficult, but when you look out at the horizon, hopefully uh, what's the unfolding and the effect and w what do you think you see over the next year or three years or I don't know. Totally. Yeah, so it's, it's by design a uh, five-year project. Okay. Um, so we'll close it five years, having accomplished what it intended to. Um, mm -hmm. One of the main ways you can identify legitimate teacherly authority 
is that legitimate teacherly authority doesn't make you addicted upon its continued uh, like working. Right, like right, basically right. the legitimate teacher gets you in a position to not need the teacher anymore. The bad teacher <laughs> who wants you to keep buying courses <laughs> right. uh, will always put you in a position to have to know more uh, and never give you the tools to learn more than the teacher knows about whatever it is. Right. So that's just a rule of thumb. So one of the reasons that we're shutting this down after five years is because we're precisely not trying to become something <laughs> that just becomes another place where people go to become addicted to our wow. form of information. The right. idea is actually to make this a thing that's enough of a catalyst so that as right. it grows over these years, all of this other stuff collects around it so that when it drops out after five years, all of the other stuff keeps going. Well, I didn't realize that was by design. That's uh, that's that's super cool. Yeah. It's the idea because because you sure. know no, it makes what we so we're didn't realize starting it. conversations like this. So we're critiquing the media. We've got we're going to get some writers. We've got this heavy theory. We're going to do situational assessments. People, are, you guys are going to replace the New York Times or CNN or something. It's like, no, that's actually not what we want to do. Right? We're not a media company. This is a an attempt to catalyze a much broader movement of awareness about the problems of media mm -hmm. so that by the time we drop out in five years, there's such a, a broad kind of array of different initiatives that have all mm -hmm. learned about one another, yeah. all been resourced through the shared attention that we're aggregating, mm -hmm. that it can start to back propagate down on the existing media wow. infrastructures, basically, is the okay. notion. And so it's not that we direct attention away from them. And now everyone's getting the news from us. <laughs> like right. That's just, right. the, that's another creation of the problem. Like, right. so we basically have to create this as like an educational play um, mm. precisely as education should be. It was like, once this has happened and there've been enough people gone through it and we get enough additional support, then there's a recap. There's enough people kind of recapacitated right. to, to then change the broader tone of the culture. And, so that would need to then result in a whole bunch of downstream things. At the end of the day, you know, this work emerged from conversations around civilizational collapse and existential yeah. risk. So at the end of the day, this is about creating some kind of new way of solving extremely complex problems at very large scales, requiring unprecedented levels of collective coordinated action. And yes. so that's like the main play of that, that we can actually... Yes, as, as my family knows that, you know, I paced around my office going global civilization collapsed because of Daniel Schmachtenberg. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Well, so that this is <laughs> right. Totally. And that's the thing. It's like, there's, there's this confluence of energies around trying to solve that kind of problem and the educational prerequisites are what we're trying to find a way to as efficiently as possible, kind of see the catalyst into the space that would put us on the direction towards a widespread distribution of those capabilities that could actually do that kind of coordination at scale on those kinds of problems. Um, and so, yeah, it's a bit of a moonshot in a way. Now, my sense is that, uh, you know, I said to Jordan Hall the other day, I said something like, um, in darkness is a niche or niche for light, right? So in darkness, there's a niche for light. Uh, and so the idea would be here that um, as the sense-making movement grows and galvanizes that a lot of unpredictable positive yes. energy could be routed to it more quickly than we believe. Because again, you can ignore those two components of the psyche and mm -hmm. ask people to live in one dimensionality and duplicity with themselves. But as soon as there's an available way to get out of that situation, which is to say, there's a, hunger. The, yep. there's a hunger. So as soon as there's an available way to actually feel like you're getting something you can actually chew on, getting tools you can actually use, finding people who are sane and reasonable and thinking in complex ways. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, so that's the hope is that we send the kind of bat signal out and we end up getting, a whole bunch of support from places we unanticipated. Um, and I would suspect actually from the heart of the mainstream media itself, there are people languishing, tortured okay. yep. <laughs> by the fact that they went into journalism to do something and are now yes. doing something else. Uh, and so, yeah, it's funny. Like I said, at the end of World War I, uh, the United States was like, Jesus, we just self-propagandized and like, it stopped and everyone was aware and they did stupid propaganda analysis, so much of a thing. 
So no one wants that to be done. And when you're under the spell of it, you're not realizing it's happening. So as is the case with psychological distress and other things that play out in the psyche, um, there are gradual things, but there are abrupt yep. phase changes. Sudden and phase shifts and sudden change. And, and, state, yeah. and state changes. Yeah, so totally. that's the hope. And that's the notion of like Renaissance or enlightenment, that there, yep. it's a fulcrum, it's a shift. Um, and so that, when I'm thinking about the vision, that's from imagining and imagining something propagating through the culture. And it may not be the Consilience Project pulls it off. It may just be adjacent. And it's just something is moving in the space towards that kind of shift. You know, I explained it to Daniel Thorson a long time ago about like, if you're in a psychotic break, okay. and then one of the ways to think about what's happening in the self-propagandizing environment is that this reality has slipped so far away that you're in the play of images without control. Mm. And it's like a psychotic break, essentially. Yeah. And so, you know, you can shut it down and drug it out, but Harry Stack Sullivan used to just keep them safe, show them respect, and yeah. just let the thing play out. And what happens there is basically, if it's a safe place, uh, the emergence of some kind of crystallizing image like a ray of truth <laughs> yep. and the therapist is like that one <laughs> and starts to just like let's talk about that one again, let's about that yeah, one again. Yeah, yeah. and then the, the exhaustion and it wears out yeah. and eventually you land and self reconstitutes around this right this kind of grain this image this yeah. kind of john and i talked about the you know the intuitive grip self-world grip it will then get an outline of a particular kind of thing you can start to cohere on yes right? exactly exactly so that's the hope that yep out of the play of all of these crazy images in the culture, something emerges that actually is going to be, we can't know what it's going to be. We can't actually totally. create it, but it will have that effect of like regrounding the, the culture out of its yep. kind of insanity, if you will. Um, totally. uh, so yeah, so that's a little bit about how that looks. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, yeah. you know that I have a special, um, first off, that's beautiful. I mean, I love what you guys are doing there. And I have a special connection to it. Uh, you know, as we talked, the unified theory really is by far the one word that connects to unified is consilient, you know. Right. Um, and it was, uh, you know, E.O. Wilson's consilience uh, that I related to. He came out that was in 1998. And mm -hmm. in 1997, I had developed the tree of knowledge and was starting to be like, oh, my God, right. there's a picture here. Like I can organize the natural sciences into the social sciences, into the humanities, you know, right. uh, and make as a jumping together of facts that afford a particular type of coherence and that kind of sense making. And I think the 20th century, really, philosophy, science, basically said, nah, <laughs> you know, the postmodern right. critique, you know, post truth, it's everything. But there's a longing for it. Uh, right. I think if we can bridge into the natural sciences and the social sciences and then do it in a way that does justice to our ensoulment and our transcendent needs, then, you know, there's a longing for that. And the idea that so many threads are coming together, it does seem that there is, uh, you know, a lot of danger, a lot of chaos, but there's a lot of hope shining through right. the darkness. So beautiful. So. Right. All right, man. This uh, was you a know, blast. I, you know, wow. I, we did a lot of good stuff. You know that yeah. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing, and I appreciate uh, all the goodness uh, that you're bringing in this very much time between worlds. So mm -hmm. thanks for coming on and yeah, for sharing that with me and others. Right on. It's good to be here. I look forward to doing it again. Hey, man. I'd love to have you back. All right, folks. I'll hit stop. The other one's recording. Well, I'm cut it off, but.